Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. As we continue with part four, Light on the Way concluded, from Masonic Initiation by W. L. Wilmshurst. Seven, the wind. The instruction lectures of the first degree, unfortunately not used in some lodges, contain a curious reference to the blowing of the wind, which must puzzle a good many minds. What has the wind to do with Masonic work and why should it be particularly favorable to that work when blowing from east to west or vice versa? Again, we must look below the letter of the reference. The subject has not been introduced without purpose and instructiveness to discern which will once more reveal the wisdom of the compilers and the crypticism with which they purposely shielded it when preparing our system for more or less promiscuous use. The wind referred to is not the atmospheric breeze, it is that wind pneuma which bloweth where it listeth, the wind of the spirit, the currents of divine energy. The east and the west are not our ordinary geographical directions of space. In initiate and biblical language, as in the quarters of the lodge, the east is the realm of spirit and light. The west, that of matter and darkness, the place of the disappearing sun. Man partakes of both. He is polarized east-west, as spirit matter in one. When mystically the wind blows east-west, a current of divine energy is set in towards the west, stimulating, vitalizing, and enlightening it. When it blows west-east, man has himself directed a current of aspiration from his own spirit eastwards to God. The wind is therefore said to be specially favorable to Masonic work when blowing from either of those points of the mystical compass. When the Mason sends up his aspirations to the heights, as he should perpetually be doing, he is as a dynamo generating and transmitting an electric current upwards, that is, eastwards. When the divine fire descends upon himself, a similar current has set in westwards. It is written elsewhere, and in the same sense, as the lightning shineth from the east unto the west, so is the coming of the Son of Man into the personal consciousness. Prayer, upward aspiration in the above sense, is a practical scientific necessity for the work of the spiritual craftsman. He himself is but as the leaden weight swinging at the lower end of the string of the plumb rule. The string itself is as the connecting wire between that weight and the top of the plumb rule, a wire through which a current may pass up or down. Until that instrument is held erect and the leaden weight brought to stillness and steadiness, it is ineffective for any form of work. So long as man is spiritually unaligned and out of plumb with his spiritual pole, directness of current between them is impossible. When that current is established, the lead of darkness and ignorance may become transmuted into the gold of conscious light and wisdom by the alchemy of the spirit. Real initiates have always known there to be both special times and seasons and special localities favorable to inducing the flow of currents of divine energy. But of these, the modern Mason has not yet come to learn, though there are references to them in his system. The two solstices and equinoxes are such times, and others are known in the greater churches whose calendar of feasts and fasts have been based upon this principle. The festivals of the two Masonic patron saints, St. John Baptist at Midsummer and St. John the Divine at Midwinter, have special bearing upon favorable times for spiritual craftsmanship. But the former is now ignored and the latter profaned. The matter may be left to the reflection of brethren. When the craft comes better to realize its purpose and science, these times and seasons will be taken advantage of for the furtherance of both individual and collective Masonic work. The teaching in the instruction lecture upon the wind is supplemented by a reference to the escape of the Israelites from Egyptian bondage under their master Moses, who caused a mighty east wind to blow, dividing the waters of the Red Sea to permit of their safe passage, which waters then rolled back and overwhelmed Pharaoh and his pursuing army. Again, the bearing of this episode is lost upon the average brother, who for want of a key fails to see its relevance to any form of masonry. And indeed, it carries us into much deeper water than the average mind bathes in. Although to those versed in initiation science, the striking biblical incident masks and prefigures an equally momentous one in the individual life of everyone who seeks to fulfill his own spiritual evolution. The allusion is to the important crisis which occurs when the personal soul of the aspirant ardently aspires for complete liberation from the tyranny of the flesh. 
It is then possible in proper cases, and this was part of the office of the old mysteries, for one who is a real master, so to act upon and separate his disciples' interior organic structures as to effect a permanent liberation of the latter's consciousness from sensual bondage. The waters that are then divided are what have previously been explained as those of the fluidic, subtle body of desire and emotion, which normally constitute an untraversable barrier between the highest and the lowest elements in our nature. Wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? exclaimed one who afterwards attained delivery. For the body of death is made up of all those lower natures in us which inhibit consciousness in the spirit, and as we have elsewhere stated, it is dissociable by a competent adept master who holds the keys of life and death, that is, consciousness and unconsciousness in the spirit. The higher nature of the disciple is then liberated from the bondage of the lower. His waters are divided. He passes through them into permanent safety from the pharaoh, like tyranny of his material vesture. The still pursuing tendencies of which are checked, overwhelmed and shut off when the temporarily held up waters are permitted to roll back to their former channel, to the extreme joy of the now liberated disciple. This is an incident of real initiation and it is achievable only under the guidance of the equivalent of a Moses, a real master. To those unversed in the deeper aspects of initiation science, what cannot here be more than briefly explained may appear incredible, as would much more that lies concealed beneath the symbols and the text of the Masonic system. But those responsible for compiling or inspiring that system were clearly deeply versed in much that they permitted themselves to do no more than hint at and it remains for reflective masons to penetrate their disguises by their own research, intuition, and perspicacity. Eight, seeking a master. The junior brother learns that as a mason, his duty is to seek a master and from him gain instruction, and usually supposes that by making acquaintance with the worshipful master of his lodge and learning by rote the rituals and lectures, he is fulfilling that duty. If he desires nothing more than ceremonial masonry, he is doubtless doing all that need be expected of him. But if he be in earnest quest of that to which ceremonial masonry is but an entrance portal, he may be interested in the following considerations. It is axiomatic in the traditional secret wisdom that real initiation is not to be looked for, save at the hands of one who has himself experienced it. And it is equally axiomatic that when the disciple is ready, the master will be found waiting. The modern Masonic student will be well advised to accept both these axioms as being as valid today as they have ever been in the past. A master is not easily found, but neither is he often properly sought. Ask, seek, knock are simple words to say with the tongue. Their putting into effective operation is a task involving persistent and concentrated will, under no circumstances does a master ever proclaim himself as such. He must be sought, must be clearly recognized and wholeheartedly accepted as one. And you may have grave doubts of his status and your own judgment about him before according him that confidence. You might live in close contact with a master for years without suspecting the fact. Recognition being due to spiritual rapport, to vibratory harmony and to intuitional certainty. Until you possess these, a master's physical personality will convey no more to you than any other man's. But of one thing be assured, the master will know you through and through long before you recognize him, or perhaps even realize that you are seeking him. Exoterically, in the operative mason's trade, the youth proposing to enter a building guild had first to find a master mason who would accept him as his apprentice and to whom he became bound for seven years the master making himself responsible for his maintenance and training. In spiritual craftsmanship, precisely the same method applies. The master has first to be sought and found, and if the disciple be accepted, he must be served and implicitly obeyed for a similar probationary period, the master assuming a real, not a nominal, spiritual sponsorship for the pupil. The association not being for any temporal advantage, but for purely selfless spiritual advancement, the intimacy is of the closest, as the responsibility is of the gravest character. For the apprentice is to become spiritually integrated with the master. To use the beautiful touching simile of the greatest of masters, as a hen gathers her chickens under her wing, so is the pupil to become gathered and built into the very being of his teacher. 
The real initiation, or rather sequence of initiations, the pupil hopes in due course to attain cannot be achieved until this intimate relationship exists. In the days of the ancient mysteries, masters were to be found resident in the seclusion of the temples, for initiation science was then an organized institution, publicly recognized. In the Orient, no such formal organization is obtained, but the practice both in the past and today is for the aspirant to seek and find his appropriate master, the onus of searching being upon the former and serving as a test of his earnestness and perspicuity. The master is there termed a guru, defined as one who removes the veil of darkness from the spiritual eyes of the pupil, and the accepted pupil a chila or spiritual child in the same sense that St. John addresses his pupils as little children. The ancient Sanskrit word guru passed from India to Asia Minor and Greece, and reappears in the latter part of the name of such ancient initiates as Protagoras, Anaxagoras, Pythagoras. The last mentioned of these literally means the Pitta, or Pata, Guru, the master or father teacher, as in fact he was in his day, and the continuity of both the science and of the title Guru is further evidenced by the fact that that title is preserved both in Hebrew and in Masonry in the name of Hiram Abif, spelt also in the scriptures as Huram and Churam Abif. Hiram Abif has precisely the same meaning as Pythagoras, the father teacher, or alternatively the teacher from the father. The Egyptian form of the name Hiram is Hermes, the teacher of the secret or hermetic science and wisdom, and the student is strongly urged to study those two important ancient treatises of initiation science, the divine Pymander of Hermes and the shepherd of Hermas. Shepherd is the ancient and biblical word signifying initiator or hierophant. Hence the good shepherd, the great shepherd of the sheep, the Lord is my shepherd. The shepherds watching their flocks at the time of the nativity were not rustics or farmers, but spiritual adepts in charge of groups of initiate pupils. A master, while rejoiced to find a suitable pupil, does not accept him without subjecting him to severe preliminary tests. He knows what is in man. No hypocrisy deceives him. He discerns the thoughts and desires of the heart of the intending candidate and sees whether the latter is properly prepared there and really anxious and ready for the work involved. Of this, an example came to my knowledge which it may be useful to record and to remember in connection with the acceptance of Masonic candidates. It was as follows. A young man in India sought out a venerable master there and asked to be accepted as a pupil and trained for initiation. He professed to want to find the light, to know God at first hand. The old sage, after a searching glance into the aspirant's inward condition, discerned that the latter, while not insincere, was still a long way from readiness and far from being sufficiently detached in desire for worldly possessions and sensual enjoyments. And explaining this, he firmly but kindly sent him away to exhaust or merge himself of these attractions, but with the suggestion that he might present himself again in two years' time. After two years, the young man returned, found the old master bathing in the river at the foot of his garden, and from the riverbank renewed his application. Again, the old man read his visitor's heart to its depths and perceived how divided it still was between the claims of the outer and the inner life. But calling him down into the river, he laid his hand upon the young one's head and gently pressed and held it below the surface of the water. Presently, the young man forced it above the surface. Why did you do that? He was asked. I was obliged to do so to find breath. Then came the master's answer. When you want God and the inward light as badly as you just now wanted breath, you may come back to me and you shall have your desire. But for the present, you want other things as much and you can't have both. Like the other young man in the Gospels, the applicant went away sorrowful. But he had found his eventual master and gained from him the instruction suitable to him at the moment. How, where, is one to seek one's master if he be so secluded, so hard to find? He may be sought both without and within oneself. He should first be sought in every event of the daily life in the person of everyone you meet. Finding him depends on the intensity of your search. Seek and ye shall find is not a vain promise. Look not to meet immediately with some learned or impressive personality capable of giving you all truth in tabloid form in a few hours. Final truth cannot be communicated at all from one person to another orally. It exists already within yourself and needs only to be dug out and liberated. 
Socrates himself a master, though the son of a poor midwife used to joke that he had inherited something of his mother's profession in that his task was to help others to bring truth to birth out of themselves. And in the same sense, the medieval teachers speak of using the obstetric hand in eliciting truth from their pupils rather than of instilling it into them. For the pupil has first to learn to clear away his own falsities and unrealities, so that what is already central in himself may no longer be obscured, but shine out in its own self-conscious light. When the time is ripe and the pupil in a deep sense ready, he may come to meet a master literally and in personal wise. But a master, being one who has evolved in his spirit, is no longer to be thought of as a separate independent person, although displaying a separate personality and presence to the world. He is integrated with others of the same rank. He is part of a group, all the members of which are conscious on the plane of spirit, and spirit is universal, not fettered by place, time, or space. What the group perceives, each of its parts sees, and vice versa. Remember the all-seeing eye, the universal watchman, that perceives you and knows the quality of your spirit, though you yourself know nothing of it. Until then, a master is met with personally, the search should persist in confidence that he will be found. Responses justifying your confidence and demonstrating that the eye is watching you will come in unsuspected ways to the earnest seeker. Perhaps from a chance passage in an apparently quite irrelevant book you may be led to pick up. Perhaps from a casual meeting with a stranger, an offhand remark, the conversation of a friend who speaks more wisely and pointedly to you than he himself realizes. Through such and other ways may the veiled master look or speak to you and proportionately to the ardor of your search will you find evidences of his presence and watchfulness. A saintly woman, a great British poetess, so keenly sought a master in the details of daily life that she would pick up torn scraps of paper in the street on the chance that they might reveal his name or yield some evidence of him. Another seeker traveled across the world in blind faith that somewhere the unknown master would be found. One day, in the street of a foreign city, the recognition came suddenly. Before a stranger in the crowd, the seeker stopped, saying, Master, teach me, and the search was ended. The master to be sought, then, is a comprehensive term, abstract and mystical, if you will, but standing for a reality embracing many personal masters integrated in it. In seeking a personal master, one seeks also the group of which he is a member. In seeking the impersonal master, one may be brought into personal contact with one of that group. Life in the realm of spirit is a unity, not a diversity, and for Masonic seekers the wide world over, of whatever nation or creed, there is but one grand master and hierophant, but he can manifest and deputize through diverse channels. As in the craft lodge, there is but one master, yet many of equal rank capable of representing him and doing his work, so has the world's grand master in the heights, his associates and deputies here in its dark depths. So far we have spoken only of seeking exteriorly for an outward personal master. But the search can and should also be made interiorly within oneself, for what is sought subjectively and spiritually can then more readily come to be realized and found objectively. The great Indian manual of initiation, the Bhagavad Gita, therefore teaches there lives a master in the hearts of men who makes their deeds by subtle pulling strings. Dance to what time he will. With all thy soul trust him and take him for thy succor. So shalt thou gain by grace of him the uttermost repose, the eternal peace. Seek therefore to realize the master in the heart. Conceive him imaginatively. Build up in your constant thought a mental image of him invested with the nature and qualities of that master soul to whom you look to raise you from your present deadness to remove the stone from your sepulchre and to utter to your inmost self that vibrant word of liberating power, Lazarus, come forth. For until you have in yourself something in common with him, points of fellowship with him, be it but a bare desire for resemblance, how shall you expect to be raised into fullness of identic relationship with him, to be gathered as a chicken under his wing? Our science in its universality limits our conception of the master to no one exemplar, Take, it says, the nearest and most familiar to you, the one under whose aegis you were racially born and who therefore may serve you best. For each is able to bring you to the center, though each may have his separate method. To the Jewish brother, it says, take the father of the faithful and realize what being gathered to his bosom means. To the Christian brother, it points to him upon whose breast lay the beloved disciple and urges him to reflect upon what that implies. To the Hindu brother, it points to Krishna 
who came and rode in the same chariot with Arjuna and bids him look to a similar intimate union. To the Buddhist, it points to the Maitreya of universal compassion and bids him reflect upon him till he become drawn beneath his bow tree. And to the Muslim, it points to his prophet and the significance of being clothed with the latter's mantle. Let the earnest craftsman then seek a master where and how he will. He cannot experto creed fail to find. Failure to find will be due to his having failed rightly and from his heart to seek. Nine wages. Initiates of the secret science in the past, our ancient brethren, are said to have been paid wages. The wages, we are told, were paid in the porchway of the temple, and much or little they were accepted without demur because of the recipient's complete confidence in their employers and the recognition that only so much would be received as their work was actually worth. The Masonic tradition asserts that the wages were not paid in cash. Cash was of no use to those who had already learned to do without money and metals, but in corn, wine and oil. Note the threefold form of the wages. Wages of the same kind are still paid to real craftsmen in the same place and in the same mode. The porchway of the temple figures the outer natural life which forms a portal to an inner supernatural life at the central sanctuary, which we have not yet consciously reached, but to which we labor to ascend by an in-winding stairway, gradually rebuilding body and mind on the way with a view to acquiring a new, reconstituted organism appropriate and adapted to that sublime degree of life. Such a new body and mind requires sustenance to build them, and the food we consume becomes built into our organism. What we eat, we become. Corn goes to bodybuilding, the fashioning of substantiality and structural form. Wine goes to the vitalizing and stimulating of the mind, strengthening the intellect, deepening the inner vision. Oil is a lubricant for the system, enabling its parts to run smoothly and without friction. In their higher symbolism, corn or bread and wine relate to those of the altar and were Eucharistic elements in the mysteries long before the Christian master in a certain upper room or higher level of application took over and gave a new application to the wheat of Ceres and the wine of Bacchus Dionysos. While oil, the crushed out and refined product of the olive, refers to that wisdom which is the ultimate essence of experience and knowledge and which has been associated in the different mystery teachings with Minerva, with Solomon and with the Mount of Olives the spiritual craftsman not only earns his own wages proportionately to his work, his own labors automatically supply them. God, as his employer, has already lodged them within him in advance. He has only to appropriate them as he becomes justly entitled to them by his own labors as the sons of Jacob found their money restored to them in their corn sacks. The mason is himself likened to an ear of corn, nourished by a fall of the water of life. In virtue of the animal element in his nature, he is himself the ox that treadeth out the corn, separating his own golden grain from the stalk that bore it. He is himself the threshing floor of Arona, winnowing his own chaff from his own wheat. He treads his own winepress alone, in singleness of effort and in the solitude of his own thought, distilling his own vintage, until the cup of his mind runs over with the wine of a new order of intelligence. He is his own oil press, and out of his own experience and self-realization, extracts wisdom, that oil which anoints him with a joy and an ability above his fellows, and that runs down to the skirts of his clothing, manifesting itself in his personality and in all his activities. Corn, wine, and oil are therefore laid upon the altar at the consecration of every Masonic lodge. They are the emblems of a craftsman's wages. Upon the collar of Grand Lodge officers are displayed ears of wheat and sprays of olive, the symbolic indication that those who arrive at the summit of their profession possess that which they exhibit and are able to minister bread and wine and oil to those below them in the order. There are less agreeable forms of wages, however, but such as also are to be received without scruple or mistrust, for they are both disciplinary and signs of progress. A man cannot set up to reform his old nature and readjust his interior constitution without feeling it or without unsettling the fabric of his emotional and mental sheaths. Accordingly, it is a common experience with those who take themselves seriously in hand in the task of self-rebuilding that unexpected obstacles suddenly arise. The wages that come to them are those of adversity in temporal affairs. 
sickness, the turning away of former friends and the like, there is good reason for this. Within ourselves are sown the seeds of all our past activities and emotional tendencies, good or evil. Within ourselves are stored all our old mind forms and fabrications of base metal. To try to disturb the former or to divest ourselves of the latter promotes immediate reaction from them. He who deliberately invokes the light upon himself as the earnest Masonic aspirant does ipso facto utters with corresponding intensity a challenge to his own bad past, his own unreal self. And if his invocation be effective, the light streaming into him from his own dormer window whilst giving him illumination will also play upon and stimulate in him all that is undesirable. As sunlight stirs to activity the unpleasant insects dwelling in darkness beneath a stone that is suddenly removed from an old position. Light impartially affects both the good and evil in oneself as the sunshine causes a rose to bloom and a lump of carrion by its side to putrefy. It induces new growth in a spiritual sense, but it also, and at the same time, accelerates the germination of seeds implanted in us, which, but for it, would continue to lie dormant and unmatured until a more favorable time. Under the discipline of initiation, the seeds or compressed results of one's own past, the potential reactions from one's own former actions and inaction, all that goes to make up a man's fate and that, if unchecked, will shape his future destiny, are brought to a sudden head and crisis. The normal slower development they would have undergone if not so interfered with becomes interrupted, expedited. It is often as though vials of undeserved wrath break upon the devoted head of him who at last has struck the road to salvation and is resolved at all costs to follow it. And yet these are the wages he receives for his laudable enterprise. Lacking self-knowledge as yet, ignorant of what is latent in him, not realizing that the path of initiation is one of intensive culture and accelerated evolution, he may become dismayed from further pursuing his quest, unless he be made aware that these wages are actually due to him, that they represent his past earnings, that he is justly entitled to them, and that the sooner the debit and credit sides of his own self-written judgment ledger are balanced, the freer will he be to proceed with his newly undertaken building work. The wages of sin are death, death in the sense of being spiritually unconscious, however vigorously alive in other ways. Sin in all or any of its forms is, in its final analysis, disharmony induced by the assertion of the unreal personal self in unalignment with the impersonal universal self, the Holy Spirit. But the path of initiation involves the obliteration of all sense of the personal self. The just and perfect man and mason is therefore one who is utterly selfless. Being selfless, he is sinless. And being sinless, he stands in, consciously shares and becomes the instrument of the divine kingdom, power and glory. 10. The Law of the Mount In masonry, as in the scriptures and every other ancient expression of mystical teaching, there is frequent allusion to mountains and hills, and to the work of lodges and chapters being conducted upon them. Let it be understood at once that in no case is the allusion to any physical mountain or geographical position, but to the spiritual elevation of the work undertaken by some particular group or school of initiates. Spiritual science has nothing to do with material things or places, save insofar as the latter serve as a foundation stone or point of departure for achieving spiritual results. From immemorial time, the Vedists of India have spoken of their sacred Mount Meru, which later in history becomes reproduced among the Hebrews as Mount Moriah. The Greeks had their Mounts Olympus and Parnassus, on the summits of which dwelt the gods. The Israelites obtained their law from divine hands on Mount Sinai, the Christians theirs from the Mount of Olives. The woodwork for Solomon's temple came from the mountains of Lebanon. The Gospels tell of the exceeding high mountain of temptation and of the Mount of Transfiguration. Prometheus was immolated upon a mountain of the Caucasus, or Cocajon, that is, ethereal space, and Christ upon the hill, Calvary. Medieval Christian mystical tradition tells of the hidden sanctuary of the mysteries and the Holy Grail built upon Mont Salvach, the Mount of Safety or Salvation in the Pyrenees, which is another form of Parnassus. None of these mountains are situate in this world, in time or place. The names are mystical names associated with superphysical heights to which man in his spiritual consciousness may ascend. Mountains bearing those names, or some of them, do exist on the map, but their names and the ideas they connote existed long before they were given a local association for symbolic purposes. 
There is scarcely a country without its sacred mountain that reminds its inhabitants of the heavenly heights and to which sacred traditions are not attached. The snow-clad Himalayas have always typified the eternal heavens to the east. Fujiyama is the sacred mountain of Japan as Snowdon is of Britain. And if such places have been, as indeed they have, the scenes of religious practices, their sanctity derives less from what has occurred there than from the ideas that resulted in those practices. The names of these sacred mountains are drawn almost always from ideas representative of the religion of the district and constitute a sort of spiritual geography which nations of great spiritual genius, such as the Indians, the Greeks and the Hebrews, have been faithful in preserving. Subsequently, the materializing tendencies of the human mind liberalize and localize what originally existed as a purely spiritual idea. When initiates of the past are said to have held lodges and performed their work upon this or that hill or mountain, the meaning is that they were engaged in work of a high spiritual order and efficacy, work entirely beyond the conception of the average modern and merely ceremonial mason. The actual place at which they met for such work may or may not have been upon a physical eminence. Often it was not, as abundant evidence might be brought to show, the entirely super-physical nature of their work may be deduced from an old Scottish degree of advanced masonry, which speaks with a dry humour that to the inexpert eye will seem grotesque and irreverent, of their lodge having originally been held upon a hill in the north of Scotland, a place where a cock never crowed, a lion never roared, and a woman never tattled. Now in traditional esoteric terminology, as also in the Bible, the north signifies that which is spiritual and ever unmanifested, as the other three cardinal points of space indicate varying degrees of spiritual manifestation. The allusion to cockcrow is to the guilty conscience of Peter, which could only exist in the world of time and in one who is spiritually imperfect. The allusion to the lion is to the evil one, going about as a roaring lion in the lower world, but unable to enter the paradisal world. Whilst the third reference is to the contemplative silence of the soul, the woman, upon that high plane of life of which the psalmist says that there is neither speech nor language, but their voices are heard among them. In the Odyssey, Homer testifies to the same truth when Ulysses is told in regard to certain mysteries, be silent, repress your intellect and do not speak. Such is the method of the gods upon Olympus. It must be left to the reader's own research and reflection to deduce the nature of the spiritual work undertaken by real initiates he will discover that it is work that is not performed in the physical body or with that body's faculties, but upon the ethereal planes and with a higher order of faculty than the average man of today has learned to cultivate. For a striking instance of the kind of work implied, reference can be made to the narrative contained in the 19th and 24th chapters of Exodus, describing a lodge of the elders or adept initiates of Israel upon Mount Sinai though for the instructed reader many other passages of like information are to be found in both sections of the sacred law as also elsewhere. To pass to a less abstruse and more elementary point, those who seek to become real initiates and aspire to the work upon the mountaintops that is feasible only to such must first conform themselves to the law of the mount. That law may be so called because it involves a loftier teaching and a totally different order of conduct from those to which the uninitiated popular world conforms. We have a reference to this in the direction that a mason's conduct ought to be such as will distinguish and set him above the ranks of other men and not merely leave him at their level. Hence the instruction given by the great master to his initiate disciples, which is called the Sermon on the Mount and is popularly supposed to have been delivered upon a hillside. There exist, however, many great pieces of initiation teaching going by that name, notably the great and eloquent discourses known as the Divine Poemander of Hermes, and all of them are called Sermons on the Mount, not because of having necessarily been delivered upon any actual mountain, but because they relate to spiritualities and to the loftier plane of thought and action upon which every initiate must live. The Mount is that of initiation, where alone, in the silence of the senses, the spirit of man can learn the things of the spirit. That the standard of thought and conduct for initiates is always beyond the capacity of the popular world is evidenced by the fact that society, however advanced in civilization, find itself quite unable to act up to it. Even the churches find the Sermon on the Mount impracticable doctrine for general social observance. It is regarded as a council of perfection 
and eminent clerics are found declaring that it was never meant to apply to the unforeseen complex social conditions of today and declare that whilst sound as a theoretic ideal, it must be compromised with in practice. From their low level of outlook, they are right. The popular world is truly quite unable to act up to the terms of the law of the mount. But it is overlooked that that high doctrine was not meant for the popular world, nor addressed to it. It was delivered to and intended for those few who have outgrown and renounced the ideals of the outer world and who seek initiation into a new and higher order of life, which contradicts the wisdom of that world at every point. But the real initiate must observe it at all cost and conflict to himself, and is told that unless his righteousness exceeds that of popular orthodoxy and convention, he cannot hope to realize the goal at which he aims. The whole life of the real initiate, and of those aiming to become such, will be at cross purposes with the standards and methods of the rest of the world, which will be as it were in conspiracy against him for not conforming to its ways. And, as with Hiram Abif, at every attempt to leave the gates of his temple and come into contact with the outer world, he will find himself opposed by persecuting ruffians, by objections to his refusal to fall in with popular conventions, and by demands to know the secrets of his superiority to them. Hence, one of the reasons for the silence and obscurity of real initiates, as also for Masonic secrecy, is self-protection, which the Christian master gave as a justification for not casting pearls before those incapable of appreciating them, lest they turn and rend you. The way of the natural, uninitiated man is that of self-assertion and material acquisitiveness. He is bent upon securing all he can get from this world, and wisdom, knowledge and power are what seem to be such in his own eyes. He is not wrong or blameworthy. He is simply fulfilling the law of his present nature, which is the only law he as yet knows. He is merely ignorant and self-blinded to any higher nature and law. The initiated man is one to whom a higher nature and law have become revealed and who, conscious of their compulsion upon himself, has abjured all the ideals of his less advanced fellows. He lives upon the mount and fulfills the law of the mount, and therefore to him come wisdom, grace and power transcending anything his uninitiated fellowmen can as yet conceive. Initiates were termed by the great master the salt of the earth, for without their leavening presence in it, the world would descend to greater corruption than it at present suffers. Ten just men, that is, initiates, shall save the city, as was said of those cities of the plain, which are a figure of civilization at large. It is not, however, for his personal aggrandizement or salvation that a man seeks, or should seek, initiation into the higher order of life, or should aspire for the wisdom and power that therewith come. To do so from this motive would be merely to imitate the ways of the outer world, apart from the fact that it would neutralize the whole purpose of initiation. His real purpose is to help on the world's advancement, to become one of its saviors at the sacrifice of himself. For the real initiate is selfless. He has abandoned all personal claims and the rights to which lesser men claim to be entitled. And having crucified his own personality, is able to look upon human life impersonally and to offer himself as an instrument for its redemption. When wisdom and power come to him, they are not for his own use, but for the help of the whole race. He is a master among men because he is a universal servant. He is the most effective spokesman in the world because of his utter silence. Masonic secrecy and silence are inculcated for this very reason, for all spiritual power is generated in silence. In silence, the aspirant must concentrate his own energies and climb from his own earth into his own heavens, rendering to the Caesar of the outer world the things that are his but in other respects fulfilling the law of the mount in a way that will distinguish and set him above the ranks of other men who are not yet ready or prepared to follow him. If the Masonic Brotherhood has not yet risen to full appreciation of the meaning of its own system, it nevertheless stands provided with all the information needful to lead it to initiation in the high sense indicated throughout these pages to which each of its members may aspire if he follow the ancient sage in Tennyson's poem and leave the hot swamp of voluptuousness, a cloud between the nameless and thyself, and lay thine uphill shoulder to the wheel and climb the mount of blessing, whence if thou look higher then perchance thou mayst beyond a hundred ever-rising mountain lines 
and past the range of night and shadow sea, the high heaven dawn of more than mortal day strike on the mount of vision. 11. From labor to refreshment. The Masonic reader who recognizes that every reference in speculative masonry is figurative and carries a symbolic significance behind the literal sense of the words, will at once dismiss from his mind any suggestion that the formula of adjourning the lodge from labor to refreshment and of recalling it from refreshment to labor relates to the customary practice of passing from the formal work of the lodge to the informalities of the dining table. The familiar formula of dismissing the lodge after seeing that every brother has received his due no doubt came over into the present system from operative usage when guild masons periodically received their material wages. But it has now become the ite missa est of spiritual masonry and carries a sacramental meaning. We have to consider what labor, refreshment and dues are in their higher and concealed sense. First as to labor, the allusion is less to the temporary ceremonial work of the lodge than to the work the earnest light seeker is continually to be engaged upon in his task of self-perfecting. Let it be realized that this is labor indeed to be undertaken with earnestness and vigor. Hic labor, hoc opus est, wrote Virgil of it. The gods sell their arts only to those who sweat for them, runs another ancient adage of the science. Purification of the bodily senses and reformation of personal defects are but part the simpler and grosser part of the work, the redirection of one's mind and will to the ideal involved, the requisite research and study conducing to that end, and the necessary control and concentration of thought and desire upon the end in view are not child's play, nor matters of casual superficial interest. Intellectual and spiritual labor necessitate rest and refreshment, equally with physical, that the harvest of that labor may be assimilated. Wise activity, Boaz, must be balanced with an equally wise passivity, yakin, if one is to become established in immortal strength and to stand firm, spiritually consolidated and perfect in all one's parts. Nor is it a work to be hurried. Those build most surely who build slowly. Festina Lente hastens slowly as an old maxim of the work addressed to those who would lay great bases for eternity. Nay, quid nimis is another. Let nothing be done in excess. Now it is not easy to combine work of this nature with that which the exigencies of one's normal duties and responsibilities entail. But to those who are in earnest, the co-adaptation and harmonizing of all one's duties will form part of the work itself. One's present position and avocation will be discerned to be precisely those suited to making advancement and to provide opportunities for doing so. Doubtless difficulty and opposition will be encountered in abundance. But these again are parts of the process and tests of fidelity. No growth is possible without resistance to draw out latent power. The aspirant must steadily and conscientiously persevere along the path to what he seeks, just as each candidate engages himself to do so in respect of its ceremonial portrayal. And every brother may be assured of receiving his exact dues for the labor he expend. There is a time to work and a time to sleep. Respite from labor is as contributive an element to progress as labor itself, for the mind must digest and the whole nature assimilate what it absorbs. More may be learned from the teacher in the heart than from what is gathered by the head, when that teacher, the principle at the centre, is once awakened. Meditation and reflection are of greater instructiveness than book reading and information acquired from without oneself. Thinkst thou among the mighty sum of things forever speaking, that nothing of itself will come, that we must still be seeking. For the care and nourishment of the outer body, nature provides a passive, sympathetic system, which arranges digestion, distributes energy, builds up the body, and discharges its functions for us, without interference with our formal consciousness. In like manner, in our higher being resides a corresponding principle which winnows out thought, clarifies and arranges ideas and settles problems and difficulties for us in entire independence of our formal awareness. It is this higher principle that must be found, trusted and relied upon to participate in the work of interior upbuilding. The old writers call it the Archaeus or the hidden Mercury, which engarners and utilizes the fruit of our conscious efforts, building them up into a superstructure or subtle body. 
As ages have gone to the organization of the physical body, so also long periods are requisite for that of the superphysical structure, the building of which is true masonry. But the process can be expedited by those who possess the science of it, as masons are presumed to do. The process itself is the real Masonic labor, and as we have shown, it has its active and its passive aspects. This is a difficult subject to treat of briefly. Its nature is merely indicated here, and its fuller study must be left to individual research and, where possible, to personal tuition. For this work is precisely that about which a Master Mason is presumed to be able to give private instruction to brethren in the inferior degrees. Let the reader reflect that Masonic labor involves the making of his being whole and perfect, that it is intended to render the circle of it complete. His complete being is likened in geometrical terms to a circle the symbol of wholeness, entirety, self-containedness. But let him remember that as he knows himself at present, he is not a circle but a square, which is but the fourth part of a circle. Where are the other three-fourths of himself? For until he knows these as well as the fourth part which he does know, he can never make the circle of his being complete, nor truly know himself. This is the point at which masonry becomes mystical geometry, the important science of which Plato affirmed that no one should enter the academy where true philosophy and ontology were to be learned until he already was well versed in that science. For in former times, these deeper problems of being were the subject of geometrical expression, and echoes of the science remain to us in our references to squares, triangles and circles, and particularly in the 47th problem of the first book of Euclid, which is now the distinctive emblem of those who have won to mastership. How many of those who now wear that emblem, one wonders, have any conception of its significance? It is a mathematical symbol representing, for those who can read it, the highest measure of human attainment in the science of reconstructing the human soul into the divine image from which it has fallen away. No wonder the great initiate who composed this symbol was raised to an ecstasy of joy on realizing in his own being all that it implies, depicts and demonstrates, and that upon that fortunate occasion he sacrificed a hecatomb of oxen, an expression the meaning of which, like the symbol itself, must be left to the reader's reflection. For these matters cannot be summarily or superficially explained. Pythagoras himself is said to have refused to explain them to his own pupils until they had undergone five years' silence and meditation upon them. Those five years represent the period that is still theoretically allotted to the work of the fellow craft degree, in regard to which the modern mason is instructed to devote himself to reflecting upon the secrets of nature, that is, his own nature, and the principles of intellectual truth, until they gradually disclose themselves to his view and reveal his own affiliation to the deity. In declining to explain these geometrical truths to students until they had familiarized themselves with them for five years, the meaning of the great teacher of Crotona was that by that time, the earnest disciple would have discerned their import and gone far to realize it for himself. Labor, understood in the sense here defined and refreshment after it, constitute a rhythm of activity and passivity a rhythm similar to that which we daily experience in respect of waking and sleeping, working and resting. To speak of refreshment, however, in the deeper sense implied in masonry is even more difficult than to speak of the philosophic labor, for it involves a subject to which few devote deep thought. The subjective side of the soul's life is distinct from the objective side, which for most men is the only one at present known to them. In that deeper sense, refreshment implies what Spencer speaks of in the lines, sleep after toil, port after stormy seas, ease after war, death after life doth greatly please. To the wise, the study of the subjective half of life is as important as that of the objective half, and without it he cannot make the circle of his self-knowledge complete. Even the observant Masonic student is made aware by the formula used at lodge closing, that by some great warden of life and death, each soul is called into this objective world to labor upon itself and is in due course summoned from it to rest from its labors and enter into subjective celestial refreshment until once again it is recalled to labor. For each the day, the opportunity for work at self-perfecting is duly given. For each the night cometh when no man can work at that task, which morning and evening constitute but one creative day of the soul's life, 
each portion of that day being a necessary complement to the other. Perfect man has to unify these opposites in himself, so that for him, as for his Maker, the darkness and the light become both alike. The world-old secret teaching upon this subject common to the whole of the East, to Egypt, the Pythagoreans and Platonists, and every college of the mysteries, is to be found summed up as clearly and tersely as one could wish in the Phaedo of Plato, to which the Masonic seeker is referred as one of the most instructive of treatises upon the deeper side of the science. It testifies to the great rhythm of life and death above spoken of, and demonstrates how that the soul in the course of its career weaves and wears out many bodies and is continually migrating between objective and subjective conditions, passing from labor to refreshment and back again many times in its great task of self-fulfillment. And if Plato was, as was once truly said of him, but Moses speaking Attic Greek, we shall not be surprised at finding the same initiate teaching disclosed in the words of Moses himself. Does not the familiar Psalm of Moses declare that man is continually brought to destruction that subsequently a voice goes forth saying, come again, ye children of men, and that the subjective spiritual world is his refuge from one objective manifestation to another? What else than a paraphrase of this great word of comfort is the Masonic pronouncement that, in the course of its task of self-perfecting, the soul is periodically summoned to alternating periods of labor and refreshment. It must labor, and it must rest from its labors. Its works will follow it, and in the subjective world, every brother's soul will receive its due for its work in the objective one until such time as its work is completed and it is made a pillar in the house of God and no more goes out as a journeyman builder into this sublunary workshop. Did I not agree with thee for a penny? said the great master parabolically. Now the round disc of the coin was meant to be an emblem of that completeness, wholeness and self-containedness which is denoted by the circle and which every mason is enjoined to effect in himself. When the mason has made the circle of his own being complete, he will not only have earned his penny and received his dues, the circle of his then glorious being will be as the sun shining in his strength and he will be able to say with the initiates of Egypt, as they contemplated the sun ascending from the desert into the heavens, I am Ra in his rising. 12. The Grand Lodge above. Express reference is made in the order rituals to the existence of a Grand Lodge above, having its Grand Master and officers. Doubtless the illusion is often regarded as but a pious sentiment, expressing the belief that after their death, worthy Masons combined to constitute such a lodge or assembly in the heavens with such a belief, no one would wish to interfere, but there are good grounds for suggesting that the reference was intended to carry a quite different meaning. It is meant to testify to the fact, which forms part of the long stream of esoteric tradition throughout the ages, that a supernal Masonic assembly not only exists, but that it preceded in point of time and constitution the Masonic order on earth, had it not so existed and preceded the terrestrial order, that order itself would not have existed. For the hypothesis is that the latter is the shadow and projection upon the physical world of a corresponding hierarchical order in the superphysical. In other words, the Masonic order on earth is the reflex and effect, not the generating cause of the Grand Lodge above. The latter is not necessarily recruited from the former, since death of the body does not constitute per se a title to admission to the Grand Lodge above, which, according to the tradition, possesses its own qualifications and passports for admission. But neither, according to the same tradition, does life in the earthly body preclude the duly qualified Mason from reception into and conscious cooperation with the supernal lodge while he is still in the flesh. A certain resemblance will be noticed between this doctrine and the corresponding theological one of the complementary relations between the church militant on earth and the church triumphant in the heavens. The doctrine of the communion possible between all saints upon whichever side of the veil. Neither in the case of the church nor of masonry does the claim imply what is obviously not the fact that every member of either community has actual knowledge or first-hand experience of the truth of this doctrine but it does imply that there have been and still are members possessing it. Farther on in these pages, more will be said of the Grand Lodge above, and in a way which perhaps will suggest to the reflective reader a fuller idea than one can convey upon such a subject, 
than by expository methods. It is a theme deserving of larger consideration than the craft accords it, and one about which no little literary evidence is available for those with sufficient interest to look for it. One such important piece of evidence shall be mentioned here. It consists of a remarkable series of communications of the highest spiritual value and instructiveness to every brother seeking to realize the spiritual essence of the Masonic system issued by a saintly man and advanced initiate, Karl von Eckartshausen, to a group of pupils in the secret science in Germany at roughly about the same period as that in which the English Masonic order was becoming established. The synchronism is not without significance and, in conjunction with other evidences, which exigencies of space prevent being now adduced, of spiritual activity at work at that time behind the events of public history, points to efforts to put forward a great movement for human enlightenment, a movement conceived from behind the veil by the Grand Lodge above and projected into the world through some of its members in the flesh. The communications or letters deal with the subject of the need for human regeneration and the rationale of initiation. In the first of them, the author asserts that the great and true work of building the temple consists solely in destroying this miserable Adamic hut and in erecting in its place a divine temple. This means, in other words, to develop in us the interior sensorium or the organ to receive God. After this process, the metaphysical and incorruptible principle rules over the terrestrial, and man begins to live, not any longer in the principle of self-love, but in the spirit and in the truth of which he is the temple. The most exalted aim of religion is the intimate union of man with God. This union is possible here below, but it can only take place by the opening of our inner sensorium, which enables our hearts to become receptive of God. Therein are those great mysteries of which human philosophy does not dream, the key to which is not to be found in scholastic science. He then proceeds to state that a more advanced school has always existed to which the deposition of all spiritual science has been confided, which has continued from the first day of creation to the present time. Its members are scattered all over the world, but they have always been united by one spirit and one truth. They have had but one science, a single source of truth, one Lord, one doctor, one master, in whom resides substantially the whole divine plentitude, who also alone initiates them into the high mysteries of nature and the spiritual world. In the second letter it is explained, I compress the substance, that this community possesses a school in which all who thirst for knowledge are instructed by the spirit of wisdom itself, and all the mysteries of God and of nature are preserved therein for the children of light, it is thence that all truths penetrate into the world. It is the most hidden of communities. It possesses members gathered from many orders. From all time there has been an exterior school based on this interior one, of which it is but the outer expression. The community has been engaged from the earliest ages in building the grand temple for the regeneration of humanity, by which the kingdom of God will become manifest. It consists in the communion of those who have most capacity for light. It has three degrees, and these are conferred on suitable candidates still in the flesh. The first is inspirationally imparted. The second opens up the human rational intellectuality and understanding and ensures interior illumination. The third and highest is the entire opening of the inner sensorium by which the inner man attains objective vision of real and metaphysical verities. The instruction goes on to explain that this society does not resemble temporal organizations that meet at certain times and elect their own officers. It knows none of these formalities but proceeds in other ways. The divine power is always present. The master of it himself does not invariably know all the members, but the moment a member's presence or services are needed, he can be found. If a member is called to office, he presents himself among the others without presumption and is received by them without jealousy. If it be necessary that members should meet, they find and recognize each other with perfect certainty. No disguise, hypocrisy, or dissimulation can hide their true characteristics. No one member can choose another. Unanimous choice is required. All men are called to join this hidden community. The called may be chosen if they become ripe for entrance. Anyone can look for entrance. Any man who is within can teach another to seek it, but only he who is ripe can arrive inside. Worldly intelligence seeks this sanctuary in vain. All is undecipherable to the unprepared. He can see nothing, read nothing in its interior. 
He who is ripe is joined to the chain, perhaps often where he thought least likely, and at a point of which he knew nothing himself. Seeking to become ripe should be the effort of him who loves wisdom. But there are methods by which ripeness is attained, for in this holy communion is the primitive storehouse of the most ancient and original science of the human race, with the primitive mysteries also of all science. It is the unique and illuminated community which possesses the key to all mystery, which knows the center and source of nature and creation. It unites superior power to its own and includes members from more than one world. It is the society whose members form a theocratic republic, which one day will be the regent mother of the whole world. Upon this description of the Grand Lodge above, by one who even in the days of his flesh claims to have been a member of it, it is not proposed here to discant, that it may provoke surprise and doubt as to its voraciousness in those to whom such ideas may now come for the first time is probable. This must be hazarded in giving voice to those ideas here, and the subject left to such responsiveness as may come from the heart of the individual reader, for obviously no proof can either here be offered or given to even the most sympathetic querist upon a matter which in its nature is incapable of verification otherwise than by direct personal experience. But with an earnest counsel to accept its accuracy and to seek confirmation of it in the only way in which such confirmation is possible, it must be left to the deep and protracted reflection of those to whom the idea of the existence of a Grand Lodge in the heavens, watching over the Masonic Israel on earth and superintending its development, is at least a matter of probability and a subject for faith they will at least perceive in the description of it given above that the Masonic order faithfully reproduces in point of form and hierarchical progression its alleged supernal prototype. And if they recognize that invisible things are in some measure knowable by perceiving things that are made, the contemplation of their own three-graded order with its ascending sequence of grand lodges of districts, provinces, and finally of the nation, will perhaps help them on to the conception of an unseen grander lodge beyond all these, one to membership of which any duly qualified brother may hope to be called to take progressive initiations no longer ceremonial and symbolic, but as facts of spiritual experience at the hands of the universal master and initiator, whose officers are still brethren of our own, though risen to the stature of holy angels. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe and comment and if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.